for those of you who don't know anything about my background, um, I'm currently working and living on a ranch uh, in Northern California, in Marin County, um, just a little bit north of San Francisco. So I did just drive down this morning, so I'm a little out of breath. <laughs> um, but, but my original training, I went to college and studied biology, and then went to law school, and then began working as an environmental lawyer for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Well, first actually at National Wildlife Federation, then went to, to uh, Waterkeeper. And it was Bobby Kennedy who put me on the path of working on livestock-related issues because he was seeing the problem of livestock-related pollution all over the United States and felt it was not being addressed by either the government or nonprofit organizations. And so I began working on the issue of livestock-related pollution full-time as an environmental lawyer and during the two years that I did that for him, I, I realized I was a vegetarian and, had, and, and still am a vegetarian. That's sort of an interesting footnote to my biography. But I was sort of initially excited to be fighting against the livestock industry because as a longtime vegetarian, I was one of those people who thought, well, that's really a big environmental problem, and the less livestock, the better. And that was something I began to rethink during those two years because I, I spent a huge amount of time looking at research on different ways of raising livestock and poultry. I spent a huge amount of time on farms and ranches all around the United States and I saw radically different environmental impacts and health impacts and community impacts and quality of life impacts for the people on the farms and in the communities and radically different lives for the animals, radically different quality of life. And I began to realize that we absolutely had to, as environmentalists, make a, a very clear distinction in our advocacy about the different types of production and the different impacts that, and not put everything in a broad brush stroke. So fast forwarding, I'm, this vegetarian environmental lawyer met and married rancher and meat guy Bill Nyman uh, moved to California from New York um, and began working on the ranch myself kind of unexpectedly and became one of the first vegetarian ranchers in the country one of the very few in the world and and I still and, and that's what I still do today so that was 12 years ago and the reason I wrote I wrote a book called Righteous Pork Chop about five years ago which describes the whole Thank you for fans of Righteous Pork Chop. <laughs> I think a number of you have read it, and I appreciate that. Um, but that book was really just sort of describing the meat industry and what it looks like and what the problems are from the industrialization, and also made the case very strongly for the value and the importance of livestock in the food system when raised well. And after that book, I actually went, did a lot of speaking and writing and did a lot of media interviews, and I had the experience repeatedly of um, people saying, I loved your book, and after I read it, I stopped eating meat. <laughs> and, I, and I just got really discouraged by this, and I, and I kept telling them, well, it's fine to choose not to eat meat. I believe you can live very healthfully without meat, but that's definitely not the point. And if you're an omnivore, I think you're making a better choice to buy well-raised meat and dairy and eggs rather than to give it up. Because if you just give it up, you're essentially opting out of the question. If you seek out and pay more for well-raised food products, you're helping to build a sustainable food system for now and the future. So it's a very different and very, very important choice. So I wrote Defending Beef largely because of my frustration with that kind of conversation that I was having and increasingly headlines that I was seeing everywhere specifically about cattle and beef. And the implication again and again was that cattle are inherently destructive, that beef is bad for your health and the less you eat of it the better and if you eat none that's the best option. And there was just, this was sort of becoming almost common knowledge. It was um, in the environmental community just that was just everybody knew this <laughs> beef is bad beef is a four-letter word as I heard someone say recently and so as someone who is now working firsthand on a ranch and visiting really well managed farms and ranches 
all over the country, I was very frustrated by this oversimplification, which was not only just an oversimplification, it was actually just creating dead wrong di direction to the whole sort of, you know, the, the movement uh, towards better food and the environmental movement and uh, public policy that is, affects food and farming. So the point of the Defending Beef book has been to try to make very aggressively the case for the importance of the grazing animals in our food system, especially cattle, because that's what I raised myself, and it's actually the, uh, the sector that has, you know, sort of been the subject of the most criticism. And so I focused on that. What I'm going to do is, um, I'm, most of you in the room know a lot about this topic already, so I'm going to do this talk quite differently than I normally would. What I want to do is help each of you think this through in terms of um, what are the actual ecological impacts and benefits of the grazing animals so that you can better articulate this in your own work and in the conversations that you're undoubtedly having with people, perhaps on an almost daily basis, about this question. Because I think there are very few people in this room that are not already convinced that cattle can have a beneficial impact when well managed. But how do you convey that? So that's what I want to try to do, that's what I wanted to try to do in this talk, and that's what the book Defending Beef is all about. So I just um, start with a picture of Bill and me, because Bill, he would love to have been here today, but we're having calves right now, as I think quite a few of you are as well, and somebody has to be there. <laughs> so he's there, and I'm here representing both of us. He's, of course, um, we're, we work as a team. We run the ranch together. We run our business, which is BN Ranch. Bill was also the founder of the Nyman Ranch Network, but left that eight years ago. And we raise our two boys together, of course, and, and sometimes write and sometimes speak together. And so I'm really speaking for both of us today. Um, so why defend beef? Again, I think the people in this room don't need to be told this because you undoubtedly see this information um, probably almost everywhere you go. But really, it's just become accepted so widely that beef is bad for health and bad for the environment. A few specific examples of this, and you'll note these are all in quotes because these are things people say, but they're not things that I agree with. In fact, I strenuously disagree with each of these. Um, each of these have a, has a seed of truth in it, which is how it begins. And, but they've become ideas that people have accepted now almost beyond question. And in fact, one of the most interesting responses that I've gotten to the book Defending Beef is a kind of um, attitude that I'm some sort of heretic. Um, the, uh, the Roots of Change organization, which is a wonderful California-based organization that works in sustainable agriculture and food, had put something up on their Facebook page about my book a little while before it came out. And, and they got a lot of response to that. And several of the responses were just unfollowing. <laughs> you couldn't even mention my book um, without being unfollowed by some of these people because it was, so, it was such a, a challenge to the environmental orthodoxy that some people hold. So overgrazing has destroyed the American West. Again, there's an element of truth to that, but that's a gross oversimplification of the role of cattle. That's, that's something I think uh, has been an idea that's been around for several decades. Around the same time, around 1970 or so, um, the idea that beef is high because it's high in saturated fat, um, it makes you fat, it causes heart disease and diabetes. These were ideas that were beginning to be believed and many people still believe them today. Uh, obviously, Rob Wolf <laughs> is doing a great job rebutting these sorts of ideas, but this is still a very commonly held belief. Um, beef is far too water intensive for our water stressed uh, state, California, and world. And again, uh, there's an element of truth to that. Beef is relatively water intensive, but if you don't look at the uh, don't look at the question holistically, then you will think perhaps it's too water intensive but I'm going to respond to that more specifically in a moment. And then beef is a leading cause of climate change. Now, I'm going to spend the most time on that last question because I think that's the most topical thing, and I think it's something that probably a lot of you are having to respond to a lot. So I want to help you do that. 
you can't see it too well on the top there, but I think uh, it's really important to always think about this question in terms of the role of grass. Now, in defending beef, I point out that even those cattle that are finished on grain, which of course in the United States is the majority of cattle, but they are all, all cattle, all beef cattle in the United States, of course, are spending a large portion of their lives on grass. So one of the things I argue in defending beef is that all of those cattle have the potential to have a positive environmental impact in our, in our you know, on ecosystems, on our landscapes, on our, to our waters. And I think it's one thing I reject is the, sign, the sort of um, polarization within the food and and farming community of people that are raising cattle that are going into the conventional system versus the totally grass-fed. Because although I believe optimally cattle are spending their entire lives on grass, all of those wonderful ranches and farms that are raising cattle on grass that eventually go to feedlots, they're playing a very important positive role as well if they're well managed. I think that's a really important thing for all of us to keep in mind in our conversations and in anything we write and speak about. So the, ben the beneficence of grass, a phrase that I'm taking from Senator John James Ingalls, who, who said this in 1872, his idea was to think of cattle and, and, uh, and the grazing animals, all the grazing animals of the field, as sort of part, this incredibly important part of the cycle of life, the sort of ashes to ashes and dust to dust. He talked about grass as something that covered any place where human activity had been and had gone away or was part of farming. It was just kind of this covering of the earth, this protective covering of the earth, and animals ate that as got nourishment from it and humans could eat that. And then all of us would basically return to the earth and be nourished nourish the next cycle of grass. And really that's kind of the bottom line. Um, because grazing animals are able to live off of uh, this unplowed land, this soil that can be very, very healthy when, when the cattle are well managed, and actually provide optimal environments for the soil microbes and all of the life that's in soil, they are really the foundation, in my view, of a sustainable food system. So wherever you have grass and wherever you have grazing animals, you're protecting the soils and the water, you're building fertility. You, if, you're, if you're doing this as part of a, a rotational farming system, you're controlling weeds and pests without chemicals, and you're providing food and habitat for countless wild animals, birds and bees, as just one example. Now, I'm just going to say a very brief um, word about food. In Defending Beef, I spend about half of the book talking about the health and nutrition side of the question because I realized as I was setting out to write the book, I wanted to just mainly write a book about the environmental impacts of cattle and sort of defend their role in, in good environmental food production. But I realized that you could have something that was wonderful for the environment, but if it was bad for humans to be consuming it, then there was still a good argument for not raising it. And so I felt it was really important to address the concerns about beef, whether they're health or nutrition concerns. And so I do that in quite a bit of detail in the book. I'll just say really quickly that I think um, very often it's assumed in, especially in the Western world, that protein, iron, zinc, and B12 are things we really don't need to worry about much. But in fact, about half the world's population is deficient in each of these categories, and much larger uh, percentages of people in the Western world are deficient than was previously believed, according to a lot of um, nutritional research that's coming out now. And for each of these categories, uh, beef or red meat provides uh, sort of an optimal source. So just to take iron as one example, I don't know if this has already been discussed uh, at this conference or not, but um, there's a, a totally different type of iron that's in plants than what's in the tissue of animals and in red meat. And if you were eating all of your um, food without including any red meat or any meat in it, any animal-based food products, and you were trying to get all of your iron strictly from plants, you would have to eat about twice as much. But even that might not be enough because the body is so much less capable of using the iron from plants. So 
um, today it's now believed that about 30% of pregnant women, for example, are iron deficient, and quite a few of those are severely iron deficient. So iron still is a very important, it, that's, that's the United States, and it's much, much higher globally. But if, if a woman is an omnivore, and is pregnant, they absolutely should be including red meat in their diet. I think that's very, very clear. Now, I'm not going to say anything more about the nutri nutrition because it's not my primary expertise, and there are other people here who know more than I do about it. But I just think it's an important point to keep in mind that beef is an extremely important part of the global food diet, and even in the Western world, still plays a really valuable and important role. So. Now looking at the ecological issues sort of one by one. It all starts, of course, with the soil. And I know there are a lot of people here at this conference who are talking about that and probably who've already been talking about it. This, this dense vegetative cover that well-managed grazing allows to be the basis of food production is kind of the cornerstone of why it's so important for the world's food system. Because where you have that dense veg vegetative cover, you have the opportunity for extremely, extremely healthful and abundant soils. About 90% of the grass plant, on average, is below ground. So, and especially perennial grasses have extremely long roots. And that's kind of uh, much of the importance of the grass plant, that their roots are able to hold, uh, hold the soil, facilitate the transfer, of carbon into the soil and of nutrients into the grass plant and to create the channels that hold the water and move the water into the soil and to create the exchange between the plant and the soil as far as carbon se sequestration. The, the, uh, the existence of those, that dense vegetative cover is what creates that optimal subterranean environment. So you have the microorganisms being higher in number and diversity wherever you have this dense vegetative cover. You have uh, fertility and you have glomalin, which facilitates carbon sequestration, and then you have the carbon. Now I'm going to talk each about more, each of those in, more in a moment. So the water issue I think is a really important one, especially right now because of California being in this historic drought. It's very often said that beef is simply too water intensive, and in fact, right now, a lot of people are suggesting we shouldn't have beef cattle in California anymore because of this, or we should dramatically reduce them. So the first point is that uh, cattle actually use a lot less water than people typically assume. Now, you'll see extremely high numbers on this. You'll see 3,000 gallons per pound of beef. You'll see even sometimes on vegan, vegan websites, which are you know, sort of notoriously unreliable sources, but they'll say 12,000 gallons for a pound of beef. You'll see, you'll see very high numbers on this. The reason the numbers are so high are two things. First of all, those always use a kind of worst case scenario. They are talking about uh, feedlot cattle that were fed ir nothing but irrigated grains and were raised on irrigated pasture before that. You can create a very high number if you do that. The second reason the number is so high, even in sort of very credible sources, is because of the type of water that they're, they're including in that. And the most important thing is they're including the, the uh, moisture that's held in the grass that just comes from the rain. That's called green water. And that, to me, there are so many reasons why it's nonsensical to include that number in the calculation. And so the, when you don't do that, um, the University of California at Davis did a very thorough analysis on the amount of water that goes into a pound of beef, and they concluded that it was about 400 440 pounds or gallons of water per pound of beef. Now that's a relatively uh, water intensive food, but it's not out of line with a lot of other foods. So it's, for example, about the same water that's in a pound of rice. And if you look at the list of other foods that are water intensive, they include sugar, avocados, walnuts, almonds, coffee, chocolate, lots of things that people eat every day and you hear very little discussion about their water footprint. So I think it's important to realize it is not out of line with other foods. Secondly, this is especially true for cattle that are raised entirely on grass um, for multiple reasons. Um, because uh, you, first of all, because 
if you, especially if you don't irrigate the land at all um, you, and you use totally naturally occurring forage, which many ranchers do, uh, you're, you don't have the irrigated crop, uh, water usage, you don't have the water that's being um, put, given to the animals in the feedlot that are then going into the waste stream. Basically, all of the water is recycled right back into the ecosystem. So this is a very important difference for totally grass-fed beef. And where you have good grazing, and this is, a, this is a point I've never seen discussed in any of these water footprint articles, you actually increase the water holding capacity of the soil. And this is a really important distinction between, not just between grass-fed beef and feedlot beef, but between basically beef cattle in general and any other form of, uh, of food production. So the um, NRCS of the federal government, the Natural Resources uh, Conservation Service, says that for every 1% of organic matter in the top six inches of soil that you increase, you add about 27,000 gallons of water to the soil. So this is a very important aspect of this water quantity issue that you never see discussed in these water quantity criticisms. The other aspect of water is water quality. And the important thing, again, is to think of grazing as a way of protecting the soil through the existence of the maintenance of this continuous uh, dense vegetated cover over the ground. Wherever you have crop production, even if you're not plowing it, you won't have that continuous dense vegetative cover, especially if you're plowing it. But even if, you're, even if you are, are not plowing at all, you won't have that same dense vegetative cover. Research from the um, uh, Land Stewardship Project in Minnesota showed that that, that uh, pasture cover versus crop um, cover um, re reduces sediment from a field by about 80 percent and um, reduces the amount of uh, not, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff by more than uh, 40 percent. Now this is just a uh, an idea of what the underground communities look like and the importance of the, the roots underneath the grasses and how they hold the soils and facilitate all this microbial exchange and create the channels for the water. The, the picture on the right is a picture that was taken by USDA soil researchers of what glomalin looks like. It's uh, the sort of honey, it's described as a kind of a honey substance that coats the, the roots and works in uh, conjunction with the fungi that live on the grass roots and facilitate this exchange between the plant that's bringing the, th through photosynthesis and the energy of the sun is bringing the carbon into the plant and through the roots is then exchanging the carbon for nutrients that the plant needs. And glomalin is believed to be a facilitator of those exchanges and also to help package the carbon in a more stable form in the soil. Here's a study that showed that when you compare sort of well-managed grazing land versus cropland, you have a great deal more bird habitat for migratory birds. And here's an article I wrote that's talking about some research that was done at Berkeley by bio biology professors at Berkeley, um, led by Dr. Claire Kremen, talking about the incredible importance of wild pollinators. And this study specifically was, this is an article that I wrote, but it's talking about her study. And it's basically um, talking about how about 40% of pollination in California today is being done by wild pollinators. This is more and more important because of the decline of the domesticated bee because of colony collapse disorder. And uh, what, uh, what she was pointing out in this study, in addition to sort of quantifying it, was that the most important habitat for these wild pollinators is on rangelands. So in addition to the benefits that the rangelands are providing, they're also directly providing crop production uh, benefits. So now to just focus really um, in more detail on climate change for a moment, these are the main uh, numbers that you tend to see. I'm, I guess I'm being cut off. <laughs> is, uh, is there sound? Can you guys hear me? It seems like the sound has died. Maybe I'll just, I'll just yell and maybe while they're fixing this. <laughs> Um, so climate change numbers vary quite drastically, um, but you'll most often see the numbers that I've uh, mentioned here. 
the, probably the number that still gets the most play was the United Nations number at the, from the Livestock's Long Shadow Report in 2006. It was the Food and Agriculture Organization's report. And it basically said that all livestock the world over contribute about 18 uh, percent to the global warming issue. About uh, two years after that, in 2009, um, two uh, policy analysts wrote a paper for the World Watch organization. Goodland described their methodology and said that they would be meeting with, with the um, they would be meeting with the FAO team who wrote the Life Sex Long Shadow Report and presenting all this information. And in fact, they did that. And in 2013, uh, the FAO issued an update of the Livestock Long Shadow Report. It was called Tackling Climate Change Through Livestock. And instead of increasing the number to 51 percent, they actually reduced it to 14 percent. Now, they explicitly in that paper explained that they had considered all of the arguments that were presented in that World Watch paper, and they disagreed with them. So this is what's really important. You see these numbers being bandied about, but the question is, which are the credible numbers? And to, in my view, the uh, World Watch number has virtually no credibility at all. And the FAO number has quite a bit of credibility, but still has some problems, which I'll talk about in just a moment. In um, 2014, the UK organization Chatham House uh, uh, issued a, a, a report about this issue. It was a report about public opinion. So sometimes you'll hear people talking about the Chatham House report in 2014. Just know that that is a report that was based entirely on the figures from the FAO. Okay, so there was no new research done for that report. It was simply an analysis of public opinion. And now, most recently, there's a film, it's a vegan film that was put together by two vegans called Cowspiracy. And, okay, am I back on? I'm back live. So probably no one uh, will ever hear that section of the speech again because it's not going to be recorded. <laughs> But in any event, you guys got to hear it, I hope. Um, so in 2014, this sort of pseudo-documentary, Cowspiracy, came out, which was based on a book by a guy named Dr. Richard Openlander. Now, he's, he's a doctor, but he's a dentist. And he's a dentist who happens to live in my hometown. And I know people who know him. <laughs> and so it was very funny how this, how, you know, again, that's Rob Wolf's point, every, everything's all connected <laughs> indeed. And so it turns out that he's just a vegan advocate who uh, has actually no credentials at all to write or speak about environmental issues. Um, but he wrote a book, and I believe it was called The Inconvenient, um, not The Inconvenient Truth, but something like that, The Uncomfortab Uncomfortably Unaware, I think that's the title of it, based on the idea of The Inconvenient Truth. And the, the movie, Cowspiracy, is based on that book. And in fact, if you look at the, um, the, the uh, credits at the end, he's also their statistics advisor. So he did the calculations, okay? And he also was, he was the person who provided them the, the core of the information for the book. He's also the main person interviewed in the movie. And throughout that movie, they repeatedly uh, suggest that more than half of global warming is caused not just by livestock, which would be the World Watch conclusion, but by cattle. So they've kind of, you know, exponentially increased um, the role of cattle. So these are some of the, you know, sort of the, the, the stories, the figures that you'll hear and the real stories behind them. And it's really, really important to be familiar with these so that you can respond to these when people cite these. And Basically, because of this incredible public discussion that was taking place around this issue, in uh, 2009, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times called The Carnivore's Dilemma, in which I tried to just break this uh, issue down a little bit. And I talked about the individual gases. And basically, when you look at car the role of carbon in, uh, in beef and in cattle, it's actually quite a small role, and almost all of it comes from transportation, automation, and harvesting, et cetera, big, um, big farm equipment. So if you take that out, it's, a, um, it's pretty much almost a non-contributor, and 
if you are talking about totally grass-fed beef, it's almost a non-issue. But even, even sort of commodity beef is not a, ma a major problem from a carbon dioxide standpoint. Nitrous oxide, it, same thing. The role of beef in the nitrous oxide issue is really almost entirely one of fertilized crops. So if you're talking about um, totally grass-fed beef or um, even non-fertilized crops, uh, it's much less of an issue, barely, barely, barely an issue at all. I just want to quickly, I'm being told I'm almost out of time. In fact, I think I was just told I am out of time, but I think I should get a couple extra minutes because I had to yell and there was no microphone, right, Chris? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so, okay. one, one minute. Okay, <laughs> I'll talk really fast. Methane is the issue that you keep hearing probably the, you know, over and over again. That's why we shouldn't have cattle, that's why we shouldn't have beef. Okay, so there are two sources of methane. One is the manure and the other is the enteric fermentation. The enteric fermentation is the much bigger piece. And basically, there are a few really important things to know about this. First of all, there's quite a bit of evidence that the number of uh, historic or prehistoric animals, and it, even in the United States in a fairly recent period of time, basically the pre-settlement time period, and humans, of course, came to the, to the Americas only about 13,000 years ago, so this is pretty recent history. The, the pre-settlement ruminant emissions are believed to be about the same. Of, of what the domesticated cattle are today. And so I think that's a really important point. This is not a new source of methane. This is something that the globe had for a very, very long time. Secondly, there's a lot of writing and discussion and research, and um, I, I was just sent some, uh, an email this morning um, about this. Um, the soil bacteria are increasingly being understood to play a really important role, not just in carbon sequestration, but also in the oxidation of methane as well. And it's not uh, clear at this point um, how, much, uh, how much methane they can break down, but what is clear is that in sort of well-managed, uh, basically when you look at it from an ecosystem standpoint, where you have well-managed cattle and you have healthy soils, there's a lot of breakdown of the methane from the soil bacteria. And so, and th those are called methanotrophs, or also referred to as um, methane oxidizing bacteria, MOB, another use of the word MOB. <laughs> and um, Dr. Christine Jones has written about this, and there are two different professors by the name of Singh in India that have been doing a lot of research about these, um, these bacteria. And there's actually a guy named Mark Adams in Australia who has re had made a statement to the press that there's a the total amount of breakdown of the methane is actually equal to the amount that the cattle produce. So this is an, you know, a question that's kind of out there. The research is obviously um, pretty new on this, but it's certainly a point that needs to be taken in, into consideration. I think mitigation is very real. Um, there are many things, whether it's good grazing practices, dung beetle populations, um, even putting metal weights into the rumen of the animals. There are lots of things that mitigate methane and these are being explored all over the world. The rice industry was the number one producer of methane from human activity in the 1980s, and they have dramatically reduced their methane emissions. I am confident that the cattle industry can do this as well. Bottom line with the climate issue is that the current, under the current system, so not even including you know, the possibility of dramatically improving um, grazing practices and so forth, which is really the focus of this, this gathering, but even just today, all domesticated ruminants in the United States, that includes the bison and the sheep and the goats, um, are only produce 2% of the greenhouse gases in the United States. That's an incredibly important point for each of you to remember and take away and reiterate when you're talking to people about this issue. That, the source of that is the Environmental Protection Agency. That's the real number for the United States. And in the recent United Nations climate um, negotiations down in Lima, Peru, that was the number that was used for the United States. So this number is accepted by the international community. And globally, if you take the 2013 report from the FAO, the role of cattle is about 9% of all greenhouse gases. That's a significant role, but it is not 51%. And now, none of those figures, it's really important to note, uh, include anything for mitigation, either from the methane-loving uh, bacteria that I was talking about, or from carbon sequestration. So there's enormous mitigation potential. Now, I normally would say a few more things, but I'm getting a very strong signal that I need to stop. I hope that I have given you all um, some tools and some food for thought, and I'm, I'm going to be here 
for most of today and tomorrow, and I welcome lots of conversations about this. But thank you for your attention.